Beneath the Planet of the Apes came out in 1970. It was directed by Ted Post and it had story elements by Mort Abrams with a screenplay by Paul Den. This one starred James Franciscus who came in as the lead to kind of take over from Charlton Heston. But Charlton Heston did appear in the film and we will talk about that. Also along for the ride is Kim Hunter and Linda Harrison and Maurice Evans who reprise their roles from the first movie. And also, we get a new character, General Ursus, and we'll talk about him as well. So, let's have a look at Beneath the Planet of the Apes. Before we begin, if you are new to my channel, please consider helping it grow by subscribing. And don't forget to click the bell icon for future notifications. So this film picks up right where the first one leaves off. And we meet Brent, who is an astronaut who went out into space to try to find Taylor. He ends up crash landing on the planet of the apes, and he becomes our fish out of water character that Taylor was in the first movie. He gets into the action pretty quickly. It doesn't take long for him to accept his situation, and soon he reunites with Nova, and then later with Zira and Cornelius. And from there, he ends up making a journey out to the Forbidden Zone, where he finds the ruins of New York City underneath the ground. But there is a weird thing going on there. There is a race of intelligent humans who are mutants and they have the ability to take over people's minds and they live in, in this underground New York City. And all the time this is going on, the evil General Ursus, who hates humans, is hunting them. And his motto is, the only good human is a dead human. This is a film that I'm very fond of. I have a connection to the Planet of the Apes movie. So when I was a kid, there was a local TV station, and I remember they had Planet of the Apes Week. It was like a marathon thing. And they played a different film every night for this one week. So they did the first movie, then the next night they did this one, and then the night after that they did Escape, and then they did Conquest. They did the whole series like that. And I could just remember as a kid being excited to watch the first movie and then, oh boy, tonight I'm going to get to watch the next one. And then, oh boy, tonight I'm going to get to watch the third one. And it just was a fun, neat thing that you don't see very often anymore. The idea that there's just going to be this marathon all week that I get to look forward to. And I have fond memories of that. So I eventually bought the DVDs of the whole series and I throw them on on occasion. I love this series, and I actually think that the sequel, Beneath the Planet of the Apes, is a good movie, and we'll talk about why. So for me, some of the highlights are the action and the pacing. Like I said before, it does not take long to get going. Brent accepts his situation right away. He's constantly under duress, he's on the run, he's stressed out, and he's trying to survive this, this crazy situation he's in. And they don't take long getting into any of that. It just kind of hits the ground running and doesn't stop from there. And the pacing, I think, is one of the great highlights of this film. It had an interesting production. So the first movie was a massive hit. So they decided, we need a sequel. So they went to Rod Serling, who had a lot of story elements in the first movie. They asked him to do a treatment. They didn't like his ideas. And then they moved on to Pierre Beaulieu, who did the first novel that this whole thing was based on. Again, they didn't like his ideas. So Moore Abrams, as I mentioned before, he was an associate producer. He came up with some story elements, and then they gave it to Paul Den to flesh out into a screenplay. And so that's how they came up with the concept for the story. Now, they did approach Franklin Schaffner, who directed the first movie, to direct this one. But he was busy directing Patton and couldn't come back for this. And so they got Ted Post, who is mostly known as a television director at the time to take on this one. The studio slashed the budget for this. The first movie was something like $5 million budget and they slashed it to $2.5 million for the sequel. A big reason for that is they had some underperforming films around that time. Hello Dolly is one of them that comes to mind and also Tora 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 movie about Pearl Harbor. Those lost some money for the studio and they were afraid to put a big amount in so they cut the budget down for this one. So it had a lower budget, a different director, different writers, but for my money it's still an enjoyable movie even though it's very much a different movie from the first one. 
So the critical response to this was mixed. Not a lot of critics loved it. Some, some liked elements of it. But there was another reviewer that I wrote down here. I got it on a clipboard of creeps. I'd like to read what he said because I think he nailed it. And so his name was Gary Arnold. He was with the Washington Post. And I'm just going to quote what he said. So he said that this film was inferior in every respect to the predecessor, a condition common to virtually every sequel in movie history. But it's reasonably entertaining and fast moving, a good enough Saturday matinee kind of movie. I tend to agree with that assessment. I think it's hard to not compare this movie to the first one. The first one was so groundbreaking and it had a lot to say on the human condition and it had a lot of lofty, deep philosophical themes going through it. And so when you get to a sequel like this, it's hard to look at it and be like, well, it doesn't have all that stuff. And I understand that and, it, and it's true. It doesn't really do that. But they decided, you know what, we did that with the first movie. In this one, let's just focus on it being a fun action adventure, science fiction, just fantasy story, and focus on that, and that's what we're going to do. And I think it works on that level. So some story elements for me I wanted to talk about. One of them is the return of Charlton Heston at the end of the story. So as I mentioned before, Heston didn't want to come back for the sequel, but he was able to come back at the very beginning of this film and then show up again at the end of it. And I think that's interesting to note because that, I believe, is commendable of him. He didn't have to do that. He didn't really want to be in this movie, so they got James Franciscus to be the main character that we follow, but he respected the story enough, the concept, the, the first movie enough, that he was okay with coming back in at the tail end of this movie to give Taylor a little bit of closure to finish up his arc. He worked with the filmmakers and he gave us the audience that and I appreciate that. For me though one of the standouts is General Ursus. So he is a militarized ape who just hates humans and I think he is a compelling bad guy because to me, the apes and the idea of them as a antagonist creature characters in a film, they're terrifying. They were in the first movie. Just this idea of these, these much more physically imposing and scary looking apes coming at you. But in this movie, they took it a step further and they gave us a general. They gave us somebody with gravitas who was able to whip up an army and come after humans. Because like I said before, he thinks humans are bad and wants to kill him and he's just mean in that way but that makes him more frightening and more interesting and I think his character is the bad guy in the story really adds an element that I enjoy it's one of my favorite parts I also want to say something about the climax I like how it pulls no punches so when Brent and Taylor meet up again you get the sense that you know maybe they're going to join forces and they're going to figure out a way to get themselves out of this situation. But the film decides to not go with the hero wins the day Hollywood trope, and it really goes for the gut punch chaos ending. And I commend it for having just the courage to do that. They could have made the heroes win at the end, but instead they took a darker turn, and I think that makes the movie more interesting. So my final thoughts on the film, Beneath the Planet of the Apes is by no means what the first movie was. Like I said before, that movie had big ideas and it had a lot of deep thoughts and themes that it wanted to explore. This movie instead just goes for an action adventure romp. But if you can look at it on those levels and just enjoy it for that, it is a fun, fast-paced, well-made, enjoyable sci-fi romp. And I like it for that. And I do recommend watching. If you haven't seen it in a long time, give it another look. If you've never seen this movie because you weren't interested in a sequel, you saw the first one and you think, I don't need to see any of the sequels, I do recommend watching this because it's an enjoyable movie. All right, so that's our movie for this week, Beneath the Planet of the Apes. Have you seen it? Do you got any thoughts on it? 
please let me know. I'd love to hear what you have to say. So thanks again for taking the time to watch the video. I really appreciate it. Until the next time, have a good one.